We're going to discuss ultrasound physics and some basic principles. We'll be reviewing the definition of ultrasound, a little bit about physics, transducers, artifacts, and some basic terminology you need to be aware of. Ultrasound is a mechanical pressure wave, as all sound is, and it's measured in cycles per second, denoted by the unit hertz. Now, audible sound, that which we can hear, is 20 to 20,000 hertz. Ultrasound is anything above the 20,000 hertz range, but medically diagnostic ultrasound is roughly in the 2 megahertz range or higher, or 200,000 hertz and higher. Sound is described by its wavelength and frequency, and you can see here the wavelength is the distance from a point to another point on the wave, and frequency is the number of cycles per second, or the number of occurrences over time. So if we look at the red marker, the number of waves that pass over that area per unit of time is the frequency. And frequency and wavelength are inversely related. So you can see here we have one wavelength with a set frequency. As we have a shorter wavelength, we have an increased frequency because there'll be more waves passing over a certain area per second. And if we have a longer wave, there's a lower frequency. Now, ultrasound is a pressure wave. And what happens is it causes tissue to vibrate. And that tissue vibrates and causes areas of compression where the molecules and the elements of that tissue are closer together and areas of rarefaction where they are more spread out. And this is how that pressure wave propagates through tissue. Let's discuss some basic echo principles and topics related to ultrasound. The first is the reverse piezoelectric effect. What happens is when charge is applied to a piezoelectric substance, it vibrates and creates a pressure mechanical wave. The reverse or the piezoelectric effect is when that pressure wave stimulates the crystal and the crystal produces electronic effect. And this is how ultrasound is produced from your transducers. And what happens is the pulse echo principle is that Sound is transmitted from the transducer to a tissue, and that tissue then reflects the sound back to the crystals in the transducer and allows you to make an image. The echo range principle means that it takes longer for sound to reach certain things, and by calculating the speed of sound through that tissue, we can determine how far away that substance is. And that's how you can have distance displayed on your screen because the distance is correlated to the speed of sound and the time it takes for that sound to be reflected back to the transducer. All of this is based on the speed of sound. And the speed of sound is related to the density of the tissue, the propagation of sound through that tissue, and the speed of sound itself. You can see that in air, sound travels at roughly 330 meters per second, whereas in bone, it travels at 4,030 meters per second. And the all-important tissue is 1,040 meters per second, and this is the default that an ultrasound machine assumes sound is traveling through. It assumes we are all made of homogeneous tissue and sound is propagated and travels at 1,040 meters per second. Acoustic impedance is the resistance to propagation of sound. This is dependent on the density and the velocity of sound measured in mega rails. There has a very low acoustic impedance at very low levels. Bone has a very high acoustic impedance. Adipose, you can see, has a mid-range at 1.34 mega rails. However, Liver at 1.65 mega rails is just slightly different, but that little bit of difference does make a difference in sound reflection. You can see here with two different acoustic impedances, sound will transmit, and with the greater difference between the tissues and the greater difference in acoustic impedance, more sound is reflected back to the transducer, making a brighter echo. Attenuation is the weakening of sound as it is transmitted and returned. Now, attenuation occurs as sound is propagated through tissues. It weakens as it travels through the tissue. Reflection also weakens the sound because as sound is returned to the transducer, less sound is transmitted through the tissue, meaning less sound will be reflected from deeper structure. Another way that sound beam is weakened is by reflection. Some sound is returned to the transducer, meaning less sound is propagated through the tissues, but some sound may also be reflected in a direction that does not return to the transducer or propagate further into the tissue, and that sound energy is lost. Scattering is when sound is reflected in a manner that it does not return to the transducer and that information is lost. There's also absorption, where sound is transformed to heat and absorbed by the tissues, heating the tissues, but also weakening the sound. There are multiple modes of ultrasound that we'll cover. A mode or amplitude mode will have the reflection and you'll see the sine wave where you see different amplitudes as sound is reflected back. This is not very commonly used in diagnostic ultrasound anymore. And instead we use B mode or grayscale imaging. The most common ultrasound mode you'll run into is B mode or brightness mode or all commonly known as grayscale imaging. You can see here each of the pixels has a brightness and is displayed somewhere from black to white on a grayscale, hence the two names B mode or brightness mode or grayscale. M mode is motion mode. And what will happen is there'll be an M mode spike or that green line that you see. And what happens every motion over that line over time will be plotted out in a graph tracing. You can see this is commonly used in echocardiograms. We're looking at valve motion. The Doppler effect means that a moving object will change the frequency of sound. So as objects are moving, the frequency of reflected sound is altered. And by interpretation of that change in frequency, the ultrasound machine can denote motion. The most common one you may see is color Doppler. And the acronym to remember is BART or blue away 
red towards, meaning blue is coded for motion away from the probe and red is motion towards the probe. You can see here in this ultrasound image of an aorta with by directional flow, you can see that there's red and blue flow as the blood is swirling around in different directions in motion towards the probe and away from the probe. Remember, the color does not denote arterial or venous flow, but rather direction related to the probe. By convention, we try to make arteries appear red and veins blue. However, this is merely by position. Power Doppler looks at the intensity of the deflectors rather than the actual frequency shift. And this is useful for low flow states, such as small vessels or ureters with ureter jets within the bladder. Spectral Doppler looks at the velocity of the reflectors going through the gate and the Doppler shift of those deflectors. and then maps it out in a wave format. And there's an audio component because the frequency shift is within the audible range. You can see here a grayscale image and we'll place the Doppler gate within the vessel. Now looking at any of the deflectors traveling through that gate between the two green bars, it will map out those deflectors on a graphical scale like this. Now let's discuss the different types of transducers. The transducers function based on the piezoelectric principle and they're a key element of the system. They're also the most expensive and the most fragile component of the system. Most modern transducers use synthetic crystals such as lead zircon and titanate. These are heat sensitive and the probe should never be autoclave for sterilization. The reason being that the heat can misalign the crystals and render your probe useless. The crystals are generally housed within the transducer. A backing layer is behind the crystal and a matching layer in front. The backing layer prevents any pressure waves from exiting the crystals in a reverse fashion and tries to direct all of the sound energy forward. It travels through the matching layer to try and reduce the acoustic impedance between the crystals themselves and the skin. That's that soft spongy layer you see on the surface of the probe. Electricity is introduced in this system, stimulating the crystals to produce the pressure wave. The backing layer prevents sound from transmitting and reflecting from the back of the crystals, and they exit the matching layer through the skin into the subject. Broadband transducers are transducers that can produce multiple different frequencies rather than a single frequency like in older systems and you can select the different frequency. And because of this, you need to understand that higher frequencies will give you greater resolution, but less penetration. Lower frequencies will give you greater tissue penetration, but sacrifice resolution. And you can see an example here, we have a sound wave as it travels through the tissue, it interacts with the tissue at several points. You can see that each time it interacts with it, that sound beam will be attenuated and weakened and be able to travel less. If that sound beam interacts with the tissue very frequently, we'll have a lot of attenuation, a lot of weakening of that sound beam, and it won't get very far. However, it will have interacted with that tissue in multiple areas and give you a better resolution. However, with the lower frequency, we'll have less resolution because there's less interaction with the tissue. But with that less interaction, there will also be less attenuation and the sound beam will penetrate deeper. Now, there's multiple types of probes, and depending on your type of ultrasound system, they may look slightly different based on the casing and the model. While ultrasound probes are designed differently by different manufacturers, the basic type of probes are similar throughout. You can see the linear array, which is a rectangular face, and this sends out beams in a very parallel fashion, giving you a rectangular display on the ultrasound screen. A curved array is a linear array that has been slightly curved. You can see that the beam splays out, giving you a wider field in the deeper portion of the image, but the sound beams are located closer together and nearer to the probe. An endocavitary probe or intracavitary probe is merely a curved array with a very tight curve on a longer handle. The phase array, which is commonly used in cardiac imaging, but can also be used for abdominal imaging, has a very narrow window, but has a very great splay. So this is very useful for cardiac imaging because the point of contact can be very small to fit in between ribs and around lung artifact, but has a very wide field of view. The resolution of your ultrasound image is based on several things. One is based on frequency and one is based on the type of probe you're using. Lateral resolution, or the ability to tell that two objects side by side are indeed two objects and not blurred into one object, is based on your beam width. If you look at the linear array here on the right side, you see those lines or lines of sight in the ultrasound beam are equally spaced near the probe and far from the probe, giving you that rectangular image. So the distance between lines of sight are fairly uniform near and far from the probe. This produces a greater lateral resolution. Whereas you see in the phase array, the lines of sight are very close together near the probe, but very far apart as they splay further outwards deeper into the image reducing your lateral resolution deeper into the view. Axial resolution, or the ability to tell that two objects, one in the near field and one in the far field, are actually two objects and not blurred into one object, is based on your frequency. Higher frequencies allow the sound beam to interact with the tissue more frequently, allowing you to differentiate axial resolution much clearer than with a lower frequency as displayed on the left of the screen. Axial resolution will always be greater than lateral resolution. Let's discuss some artifacts that you may run into as part of using ultrasound. Artifacts are based on several presumptions that the ultrasound machine makes, one of which is that sound travels only in a straight line, sound speed is uniform throughout tissues, a single pulse from the probe 
is emitted and returned, attenuation is uniform, and signals only occur from the main beam of the ultrasound. Shadowing artifact is produced when there is a high difference in acoustic impedance. What happens is there is a high attenuation of the sound beam, and that sound, because of the high acoustic impedance, is reflected back to the transducer, making a very bright image, but no sound is transmitted past that interface. You can see here in the gallstone, we can see the bright interface where the sound beam is reflected from the gallstone. Now the gallstone is not calcified, but it can have very high acoustic impedance compared to the tissue around it, and therefore sound does not penetrate further. And this area highlighted in black would be the area of, of acoustic shadowing, meaning that sound is not transmitted past that surface. You can see here as we scan through a gallbladder with multiple stones, you can see the area where the stones are, and the sound beam is reflected back to the probe with shadowing behind it. Posterior acoustic enhancement occurs when there is a very low attenuating surface, and this occurs when there is a fluid interface. Now the fluid does not interact with the sound beam as it does with solid tissue, and therefore the sound beam is not weakened. So the sound beam remains very strong. So when that echo returns from behind the fluid structure, it has not been attenuated as greatly as if it traveled through tissue. The ultrasound machine interprets this as a greater signal and makes those images brighter. You can see here behind the fluid filled bladder, the soft tissue is very echogenic and very bright, much more than the surrounding structures. And this is because the sound that has traveled through the bladder has not been weakened as it has only traveled through fluid rather than tissue compared to the lateral aspect. And the sound that is reflected is much stronger, meaning much brighter. Defocusing artifact occurs when there is a fluid interface, and what happens is the fluid bends the sound beam and it causes a defocusing artifact. Most commonly, you'll see this as called lateral cystic shadowing, meaning that as the sound beam travels through that fluid interface, it is slightly bent. There's a slight refraction of the sound beam, causing some echo dropout towards the edges because the sound that would have traveled through that tissue behind it has been bent inward. You can see here on the internal jugular vein, there's evidence of lateral cystic shadowing here because the sound beam that would have traveled into that tissue has been bent slightly inward. Mirroring artifact is because when sound travels, it hits a very strong reflector. It bounces off that reflector to interact with tissue, returns through that deflector, and returns to the probe. However, the probe and the machine assumes that sound has only traveled in a straight line. It therefore takes that reflected sound and maps it in a straight path. You will most commonly see this in your FAST exam when you're looking above the liver. A sound beam interacts with the diaphragm, reflects off the diaphragm into the liver, bounces off that tissue, back off the diaphragm, and back to the probe. The effect of that is that it appears that there is liver on both sides of the diaphragm. This is called the marine artifact and is a normal occurrence with aerated lung above the diaphragm. And you can see as we're scanning through, you can see that the liver appears to be mirrored on both sides of the diaphragm. Reverberation artifacts occur when sound travels into tissue. Because of high reflection, the sound bounces within that tissue and returns multiple signals to the probe. Because the probe assumes that ultrasound has traveled only in a single line, those reflections and reverberations are then mapped in increasing depth throughout the image. You can see here the reverberation line passing in through the bladder, and you can see that it does cross anatomic boundaries leading you to the assumption that it is an artifact. It is a reflection of the probe bouncing off the peritoneum on the anterior surface of the bladder. You can see here that the ultrasound beam reverberates between the pleura and the pneumothorax. And you can see those reverberation artifacts passing throughout the field of view here. This is also what produces your beelines in pulmonary edema. In pulmonary edema, the space between the aerated lung and the edematous tissue of the lung is very small, so those reverberation lines are very narrow and very close together, looking almost like a vertical line. So let's discuss orientation and planes. There's an indicator on the probe, which aligns with the indicator on the screen. Unfortunately, indicators may vary by probe and by manufacturer. Orientation is based on the indicators, and body orientation or abdominal preset orientation is based that the indicator will be pointed towards the patient's right, the patient's head, or somewhere within that 90 degree range. And this is so that you can look at the ultrasound image and be able to orient yourself as to the direction of the image. So by convention, the indicator probe should be pointed towards the patient's right, their head, or somewhere within that 90 degree plane. So if you look at this ultrasound image, both of a transverse and a sagittal image, because of the indicator and orientation convention, I can tell that on the transverse image, we can tell which is right and which is left. And on the sagittal image, we can tell which is cranial and caudal. You can see here in a sagittal image, because my indicator is oriented towards the patient's head, I know that the indicator side of the image is towards the patient's head or cranial, and the bottom of the image is towards his feet or caudal. In a transverse image, because the indicator is oriented to the patient's right, 
I know that the right side of the image has the indicator dot on it, and the non-indicator side is the patient's left, making the structure measured is abdominal aorta and not his IVC. Let's discuss imaging plane. Sagittal images are cutting from an anterior to posterior plane, and the indicator would be oriented towards the patient's head. A coronal view is cutting from lateral to medial, and the indicator would also be pointed towards the patient's head. A transverse view would be going from anterior to posterior, and the indicator would be oriented to the patient's right. Now an oblique view would be somewhere within that 90 degrees, and the indicator would be pointed towards the patient's right side or towards their head somewhere in that 90 degree range. Cardiac orientation is slightly different. Cardiac orientation has the indicator pointed towards the patient's head or their left side. Now, unfortunately, when we talk about head, we're actually talking about the superior portion of the heart. So the indicator should be pointed towards the superior portion of the heart. And because the heart is an oblique structure, we are sagittal to the heart and not necessarily the external anatomy of the patient. You can see here that the indicator is pointed towards the external anatomy of the right shoulder, but on the image, it is actually pointed towards the top of the heart, giving you a sagittal view of the heart rather than a sagittal view through the patient's body. And mostly when we discuss specific organs, we are talking about sagittal and transverse in relation to that organ and not necessarily external anatomy. So once again, in a cardiac preset, we are sagittal view of the heart, indicators towards the top of the heart or the head portion of the heart, and the non-indicator towards the foot or the bottom portion of the heart. In a transverse view, the indicator is oriented towards the patient's left side, so that when I look at the image, I can see a transverse cut through the left and right ventricle, and I know which is the left and which is the right ventricle based on probe orientation. Let's discuss some ultrasound terminology used to describe images, and this is echogenicity. The amount of echoes or the amount of whiteness within an image determines its echogenicity. And it can be hypoechoic, hyperechoic, isoechoic, or anechoic, and it is a relative scale. For instance, we see more echoes within the circle, meaning it is more white within the circle than the surrounding tissue, so the circle is hyperechoic to the surrounding tissue. The surrounding tissue is hypoechoic to the circle. Here we see that there is less echoes or less whiteness within the circle, so the circle is hypoechoic to the surrounding tissue, whereas the tissue is hyperechoic to the circle. Here we can see that there is the same amount of echoes within and without the circle, so the tissues are isoechoic or of similar echogenicity. The circle here is completely black and has no echoes within it, so it is anechoic. You can see here on this image of the lower thorax with atelectatic lung, spleen, and a pleural effusion, we can use those descriptors to describe the image. The collapsed lung and the spleen are isoechoic to each other. The spleen and the spine are of different echogenicity. The spleen is hypoechoic to the spine. The spine is hyperechoic to the spleen. Here, the pleural effusion, which is fluid, is anechoic. Don't forget to follow on YouTube, Twitter, and subscribe to the channel.